All right, I would like to thank all of you for coming this afternoon here in Boulder. It is June 23rd, 2018, uh, just for the record. And uh, we're going to take a quick trip through the cosmology and then a deep dive into what our folks at the CIA call WSFM. Not a radio station, it stands for Weird Science and Frickin' Magic. All the classified technologies, where they're located, when they were developed, how they've been deployed, et cetera, and so on. So uh, I'd like to thank first some folks who've made this possible, the University of Colorado School here, Wolf uh, Law School, which has provided the facility, uh, Neil for his webinar help, uh, Lara and Ricky and Marcel and Grant, and all the folks out front who are our volunteers, thank you all for making this happen. And a big thank you all for coming here in person to spend your Saturday afternoon with us. Uh, I would like to uh, start by saying that, give you a little bit of context of why I'm doing these last few webinars and seminars. Um, there's a need at this point for me to do a brain dump, for lack of a better word, out into the public domain uh, ahead of some things that the public needs to know. Um, these are some of these are subjects that I've talked about peripherally, but I think it needs to go into in more depth. Uh, to understand where this knowledge has come from, many of you have seen the Disclosure Project witnesses, and there will be parts of this information scattered throughout their testimony, uh, but I'm trying to pull it together into a three-hour condensed package so you kind of get your minds around it. Keep in mind that only one in ten disclosure project military intelligence and corporate witnesses, about one in ten, have been willing to go on videotape and be identified to the public. Ninety percent do not want to be. Um, there are some recent ones since the movie Unacknowledged came out that have surfaced that are uh, really the most important yet uh, and most current who have been in certain unacknowledged special access projects, which are the deep black projects, that's the proper name, that's where the title came from, unacknowledged. And I want to put together for all of you t today an understanding of the cosmology that's gotten very mixed up in the UFO subculture with the knowledge that I've gained since 1990 uh, having been dealing with various people in the intelligence community, which I will call IC from here on, and military and corporate world who have worked in this space dealing with extraterrestrial technology, uh, zero-point energy, extraordinary electromagnetic field propulsion and communication systems, et cetera. There's a, over 950 of these top secret sources that I have now. And we started out with about a dozen, and by the Disclosure Project we had a few hundred, about 70, 80 came forward on videotape. It's now 10 times that. And with that has been some frustration for me, and I want to share it with you. Um, because in an ideal world, all of those people would come forward, name, rank, and serial number. But we don't live in an ideal world. And as a physician, I respect the confidential information that people give me. So if it's confidential and they ask that I keep their uh, name and identity confidential, I keep it confidential. That, however, puts me in a very bad position because I'm walking around in my little random access memory uh, with 28 years of information from about a thousand of these people. And that's hard. <laughs> really hard. You know, you're just going, ah, how do I get this out to the public? So what I'm trying to do today and in the next few uh, uh, webinars that I'll do over the next six months or so is to provide as much of that information to the public uh, as, as we can. And I think it's important for people to appreciate that we're not, I'm not in a position to, to 
force anyone to identify themselves. What I will try to do is give you their provenance, what command they were in, the kinds of information they were read into. Read into means briefed in military speak. And uh, how I came about that when appropriate. In general, I think it's more important to focus on the knowledge and the information than the, than the source, per se. Um, I don't repeat things from questionable sources. Um, I question you know, everyone. They have to provide me proof that they were in the command. They have to give me their badges, send them to me, sometimes physically send them to me if it's a classified badge. And I have to see this. So that's what I rely on. And that's why the Disclosure Project has been and is the gold standard for people uh, all over the world for finding out about this issue. That's really what I want to share. And it's from those sorts of uh, sources and methods, as they say, in the intelligence community. But before we can even get into that, we have to start with something more fundamental. And that is, what is the thing called reality that we live in, the cosmos? And I know this sounds like, well, what, what does that have to do with these unacknowledged special access projects and their technologies and facilities? Everything. Because if you don't understand what's sitting in front of you on the screen right here, there's no way you're going to understand the kinds of technologies we're going to cross over into very quickly today. So first, I want to go through this concept of everyone knows about the conventional universe. 3D, 4D, if you call it, consider time a dimension. Some do, some don't. Uh, it's the material universe, space, time, matter, light and dark matter, dark energy, et cetera, and so on. That's what astrophysicists, star systems, galaxies, um, subatomic particles, conventional physics and conventional understanding. Then there's the conscious universe. And there are other dimensions connected to the conscious universe. And you see where I've done sort of an overlap. So we have a physical body, but we're conscious, and we can be aware of awareness. And because we can become aware of awareness, we can remote view. We can see the future, see the past. Uh, and, of course, the masters and rishis of old could teleport, materialize, dematerialize, etc. So all conscious, higher, intelligent life forms have the ability to manifest. That's a strange sound, it's like from that <laughs> horror movie. It have the ability. <laughs> have the ability to do, uh, affect the physical cos world and the physical cosmos in ways that an tr interstellar, transdimensional extraterrestrial civilization can. This is lesson number one. It's a hard lesson. It's a really deep one. So if you can imagine all the stories you've heard of the masters uh, of, of old, or even people in the modern era who have levitated, well, you can do a, le a levitation, mass cancellation, so-called anti-gravity, through resonant field electromagnetic systems. Now let's talk about remote viewing. Everybody's heard of remote viewing, CIA programs, DARPA, DIA. I know a lot of these guys. Well, that's the ability to be a seer and use consciousness to see something at a remote distance or a remote, remote point in space-time. But that can be done through augmentation using electromagnetic systems, which is what interstellar civilizations have and covert programs have. This is the part that you're not going to hear and see in Hollywood. And that's what you're going to hear about today. So you'll see that I put that extraterrestrial civilizations, all of them, that are higher intelligent sentient life forms. That's how I'm defining this. They're capable of being aware of awareness and humans, and then there's this subsection here, covert technologies that are augmented by the study of ET systems and transdimensional stagecraft. These are the ones that are going to be a big deep dive in a few moments. You understand? 
because it isn't just, everyone thinks that the secret technologies have to do with Lockheed Martin and Northrop's and Boeing's anti-gravity black triangles and flying saucers and things like that, which they do have and have had since the 50s, perhaps a little sooner in terms of prototypes or a little earlier. However, this part has not been looked at by the public, and this is why I want to pull the curtain back. Because there's a, 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 a what I call a strange phenomenon going on, where you have a, sort of a Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, pulling strings and levers, scaring, you know, scaring the hell out of people with stuff that looks other dimensional and looks extraterrestrial, but is being run from an unacknowledged special access project. And I know who they are, where they're operating from, what their technologies are, and what their modus operandi is. That you need to know. And you need to know it 50 years ago when they, with the advent of those. So that is why this is its own, and this, we'll see a later slide. Now, in the other conscious dimensions, we'll take a quick trip through these. Probably everyone in this room, if it was a physics class, they'd be going, huh? But everyone in this room presumably knows what this is. But let's relate it. Let's pretend there's someone here from the School of Physics. You're conscious and awake. You go to sleep at night. You awaken in a lucid dream where you're flying. And that dream ends up being precognitive. You see something that happens the next day or the next week or the next year. This is a lucid precognitive dream. How many people have had one at some point in their life? Very large percentage of this audience. Most humans have, although most scientists won't admit to it because they don't want to be discredited. I, on the other hand, as a medical doctor, didn't care what people thought. Um, I said, you know, if you don't believe it, fine. Fuck off. Anyway. Uh, uh, charming. OK, so that, <laughs> that is actually an activation of the astral cosmos and an interface between yourself and the so-called spirit world. And during such an experience, you may have an encounter with an ancestral being, someone who was on this planet before you. It could have been a grandmother or a grandfather. My great aunt, who I was very close to, visited me the day she passed away and came into my room that night. And I saw her as a 30 or 40 year old, beautiful, and then she went off, and she said goodbye to me that way. That was a very real experience. I didn't even know she had passed away. I found out the next day. That is a very real experience. And then there are other consciousness that are entities that are not human, but not ET. All right, this is the part that gets everyone stumbled. And these are, are beings that reside in other conscious dimensions and other dimensions that are not physical planets with physical star systems with material bodies. But they're conscious, they're living, they're thinking, they're volitional, they have will, and they can push into an interface with this dimension under certain conditions. And those are, strictly speaking, interdimensional beings of different kinds. And some have had experiences with what they would call very high angelic-like beings. Others have had experiences with some very rather unfriendly entities <laughs> and what have you. And so those are absolutely real. And they can be quantified in some of the classified labs. And in fact, uh, the technologies that exist in very advanced laboratories can tap into those dimensions and bring them into this dimension. There's such a project going on right now in Salt Lake City. So I think that what you have to understand is that these other dimensional realms have beings that are neither human nor extraterrestrial as you would think of extraterrestrial, meaning someone from another star system, from another planet, with a spacecraft and it's traveling across the distances of, of space time using advanced technological systems. But as they do so, here's the confusion. 
There's an intersection. They are crossing into the ETs that are in this material cosmos have technologies that look like this. They look like that. What do I mean? You're not going to take an object and accelerate this to the speed of light and beyond to go from the Andromeda galaxy to here that's two and a half million light years away. Why? Because in this form, as it would approach light speed, it would take on infinite mass. Therefore, you employ a type of physics, resonant field, high frequency physics, where this, all the elements within it, subatomic, atomic, molecular, resonantly, the, if you understand spin theory, we won't get into too much of the physics of this, tilts it out of this dimension into the, let's call it, near astral, this, the interface between this and the astral, between your body and the astral, there's an interface, there's a layer that you can slip along. And that's how you go from one star system to another. And I'm, dro I'm dropping a very big secret here. <laughs> because this is why people will see an extraterrestrial vehicle and it will vanish in front of their eyes. People say, oh, it cloaked itself. It didn't just cloak itself. You could walk straight through it. It has shifted out of this dimension just enough tilting. Let's take the spin and angular momentum of the subatomic molecular structure of that craft and everyone on board a little bit out of this fixed linear space-time so that it can appear to disappear and dematerialize and then boom it pops on oh, all over the outback of Australia a nanosecond later or instantaneously or it simply bilocates we'll get into this again one of the Vedic cities of the ancient Vedas, cities are the powers and abilities and consciousness that develop, is bilocation, trilocation, dematerialization, levitation, solid objects going through another solid object. All of those cities that can be developed, S-I-D-D-H-I-S, are abilities that are innately within every human being, but also every extraterrestrial, but they can become routinized or scientifically applied by civilizations advanced enough in their science and technology. Does this make sense? So here's where you get a big confusion, because there are a lot of people having experiences with these, and even beings that are not even in the astral, but in the uh, pure thought realm, and they will think it's extraterrestrial because they know it's not human. Guess what? It's neither. And so there has to be this discernment, because it, in the UFO space, there are a lot of different phenomena, plural, being described as one phenomenon. Big mistake. That is the first fundamental mistake of the UFO studies area. And it needs to be corrected, because it's being exploited by the intelligence community to fool everybody. This is where I'm going with this. Does this make sense yet? Where I lost anyone. Okay, this is sort of your sort of introductory thing about the cosmology here. The reason, you know, understanding this seems really arcane, but let me give you a couple examples besides the lucid precognitive dream. Let's say, uh, I'll give you an example of a Lockheed Martin Skunk Works guy. Now, here's a little interesting story. A lot of these military witnesses it's kind of transactional. I hate to use that term. They come to me to give me information because they want to pick my brain about stuff they don't understand. Does that make sense? Okay, but it's fine. I'm happy to teach. The word doctor, docere, from the Latin means to teach, so there you are. Um, so this one man approached me, and uh, Don Phillips, Lockheed Skunk Works, and he was just going to be a military and Skunk Works witness dealing with a radar case of these objects at a Skunk Works facility where he was working. And you can read his testimony in the book and also on our YouTube site, which is youtube.com slash s disclosure. 
as in, in serious disclosure, S disclosure doc. So that has about 70 of these top secret military witnesses up there for anyone who wants to take the time to look at all of it. But one of the reasons he contacted me, he told me the story, he said, I'm happy to be a witness to this. It happened ages ago in the 60s or something. But I really want to know something and ex have explained to me something that I've never understood. Because back many years ago, he was studying to be a Roycecrucian. And he was going through some training program to do what's called astral projection. You know, I've never taken the course, but apparently they're trained to go from their physical body and then go out with their astral body and under volition have a controlled sort of journey. And he was really studying this hard. And finally one day his teacher came in and said, look, Don, you're ready to do this. You're just mentally, intellectually you know, hung up on it. Just let go, relax, go lay down on your bed and do it and just intend that you can do it, which is a really key point to meditation and doing the cities. You just intend that you can as if you can and you do, right? Okay, so he did it and sure enough, boom, he launched up out of his body, but he, as he called it, an uncontrolled launch, went up through the ceiling of his house and the roof of his house into the atmosphere and he went up to and slammed into an extraterrestrial vehicle that was up in high orbit um, that, you know, and he recognized instantly what it was. Now, anyone who's had a lucid dream or an out-of-body experience, you know that what you see is even more real than this looks here. It's like this hyper-reality. You know, it's beautiful. And that's what you experience in your near-death experiences as well. And, uh, but in his case, here was this ET craft, and it was up in the atmosphere. But he says, I don't understand. I wasn't in my physical body. I wasn't in this. But when I hit the craft, it moved. I, and he said, I should have just gone right through it, but how could the density of my astral energy light body affect the ET craft this way? I said, ah, because they were of like density. The ET craft, if anyone was, was looking up in the sky, would have not have been visible. It would have been shifted into the, quote, near astral. And there was enough similarity of the resonant frequency of that astral body that you launched out into the sky with and the ET vehicle that was shifted just out of 3D and 4D, but was hovering there. They don't have to be traveling that way. They can just hover. You won't even see them. You have to sense them. And he did tell a funny story. He said, well, it was really kind of embarrassing because I popped into the inside of this craft, and there were these ETs at a console that looked at me like, my god, why don't you watch where you're going? <laughs> and, you clumsy cosmic traveler. And uh, he was actually quite embarrassed by it. I said, well, yeah, it was an interplanetary diplomatic faux pas. You don't just barge in. <laughs> now, that's a really true story. He didn't understand this. He did, he under, I mean, he was a scientist, and he was also someone who had worked in a lot of classified projects, and he understood the human experience of the spirit world, let's call it, and the astral body and near-death experiences and things like this. But he did not understand why the extraterrestrial vehicle would have been affected by his astral body that way and actually bumped and moved. And I said, well, because at that point, it was shifted into a, an energy form that was very similar to the density, the quantifiable, and it is quantifiable, density of your spirit body your astral body. He says, oh, that makes sense. I say, yeah, it's actually not hard to figure this out once you understand this. If you understand the entirety of all that exists is consciousness shifting and phasing in different densities, and that includes this podium and everything. Everything is conscious, and everything is consciousness phasing in a different way. Now, luckily, before I was a meditation teacher, I became a 
I mean, before I was a doctor, I became a meditation teacher with Marion and Jeff Kramer, who are here from the local area. At 44 years ago, we met out at MIU and became uh, meditation teachers together in my misspent youth. <laughs> it, was, yeah, it was awesome. Uh, and it, it was very good that I did that before I went into medicine and all of this, because it laid a foundation for me to understand what is the reality, not only of the human condition, the deep spiritual cosmic level of human potential, but also of space and time, which is also conscious. The entire cosmos is a conscious hologram that is awake and everything in it. Now, the civilizations that have figured out how to go from one star system to another have mastered the science of consciousness very well. Uh, and they understand that, and then they can develop technologies where it interfaces with, say, communication systems. So that they have a little black box. No, it's not an Apple iPhone, but it'll be a little thing. And they can think to it, and it transmits the information, thought to thought, person to person. So you say, well, couldn't you do that telep telepathically? Yes, you can, but there's an, a factor of error there. Whereas if it can be done scientifically and precisely, then you develop that capability, which is what they have. But it also means they have those technologies that cross over into the propulsion systems, teleportation systems, materialization, dematerialization, et cetera. These are all the things that began to be drilled down on hard between the early 20th century and today. So about 100 years of classified research. We're going to get into this. Therefore, if it sounds confusing to you, it's only because you have to stop for a moment and think, what is within me? I have a physical body. I'm in this physical room on a physical planet going around a physical star. But I also have within me my body of light, the essence of my reality, the causation, the thought being, the tone within yourself. There is actually a resonant tone, like a mantra, but it's unique to everything in creation. That is like a standing wave that manifests, and it's called the thought, sound component of thought. It's what a mantra is. And then deep within us is this transcendent level of consciousness. And we're all part and parcel of that field. And that's why there is no separation in space and time once you understand that every point in space and time and all matter, this is where entanglement theory and what Einstein called the spooky effect, where you know, he observed that something in one place was affecting another place instantaneously, and he called it spooky. But that's what non-locality in physics is. Right? You've all heard of non-locality. This is the ultimate non-locality, is this state of transcendent consciousness, which, FYI, is folded within every single one of you. What the samadhi state is, is what you sit and you meditate and you enter into that. And sometimes you get it clearly, sometimes you don't, but that's what the meditative process can lead to. And some people call that awakening or enlightenment or what have you. It's really the ordinary state of consciousness. You are always that whether you recognize it or not. That's the beauty of this. Now, your individual ego may not recognize it or even understand it, but then phenomena happens, like intuition, precognition, lucid dreams, et cetera, and so on. And miraculous things, where you hear about people who suddenly are able to pick up or almost levitate a car off a child, way beyond what any human strength should be able to do when they need to, because they put their intention on it. So, you see what I'm saying? So we all have that within us, every single one of us, but also every single extraterrestrial being. So just remember that as we go through this. Now, that capability can be exploited for the good, the common good, for enlightenment, for healing, free energy, all kinds of things. Or it can be used as a weapon system. So I'm not 
trying to scare the hell out of you, but by the end of this, you will be. And, <laughs> and you, but don't be. But you, you probably will be, but I'm going to tell you at the end why you shouldn't be. Uh, okay, let's go to the next slide. And <laughs> this is a little more of a deep dive into what we call alien. And the reason I want to call this out for what it is, I mentioned it a moment ago, there are all kinds of um, phenomena being called alien. And I've, had, I've met with people who've had uh, encounters with like a poltergeist. You know what a poltergeist is? Somebody who's passed away and comes in and is, you know, moves something around. They say, oh, it was an alien in my house. Well, it was no such thing. It was not an extraterrestrial biological life form from another planetary system. It was someone who lived in that house 200 years ago and is pissed off that you know, he died somehow, unfortunately. I tell a great classic story of this. And so this gets into you know, <laughs> this sort of experience where they're in another dimension. They're not in the physical body anymore. Uh, the ancestral spirits, poltergeist, astral dimensions, there can be lower and higher frequency all the way to angelic and celestial. But I was in the emergency department once. I don't know if you've heard this story, but it's, a, it's, a, it's illustrative. And it finally was quiet for one nanosecond. And, but previously, a man had died in uh, the trauma, one of the trauma rooms, um, and it was a violent death a murder, and he was intoxicated, and he was not a happy camper. And about 3, 4 in the morning, in the room, the room in which he passed away, now the whole emergency department's empty. Now I'm sitting there with the nurses and the, the secretary, and we're just sort of hanging out till the next case comes in. Suddenly, the EKG machine turns on, the cabinets open, the IV bags start being thrown out of the cabinet, and the IV pole, you know, the drip, beep, beep, drip, all that turns on. And it, the whole thing is like a whirlwind goes in this one little room, and it's this guy pissed off. He's really mad. I did a little prayer where I connected him to the most great light uh, that is within all things and all in us, and sent him on his way, and he stopped. And the nurses say, what did you do? I said, well, I just kind of connected him to where he needs to go. But this sort of thing, almost all critical care medical people have a story like this. And in the emergency department, you saw a lot of it. Now, that wasn't an alien. That was a guy who just had been murdered, who was very intoxicated and who was furious, and came in and was able with his spirit body to push into this dimension a little bit. And that's what Poltergeist is. It's like the movie Ghost with Demi Moore. Have you ever seen it? No. So, and that phenomenon is absolutely real. Now, a lot of people have had experiences with beings from other dimensions that are not extraterrestrial that can have that effect in this plane, and they will think it's an ET, and it isn't. It's really important for you to get this. Um, so what is being called alien and what has been kind of thrown all together into one category they are ex actually extraterrestrial, and these are the ones that are transdimensional interstellars. I call them TDIS. These are ET beings capable of interstellar travel using these advanced transdimensional technologies where they go from one point in space-time to another, but not in a linear way. They're dropping out of linear space-time and traversing these dimensions, which means that they're not limited by the normal limitations on matter and space and time. Because otherwise, there'd be no way they could go from another star system to here. That's how they're doing it. But there are also ETs that people can have experiences with that are planetary bound. Let's say that, you know, I doubt anyone in this room travels around to different galaxies, maybe, I don't know, but unlikely. But in consciousness, you could go to another planet and you could actually visit an ET civilization, and you may see one that is at our stage of development or even perhaps more primitive. And that is through the field of consciousness and the ability to remote view and teleport. 
using this subtle body. So people have had experiences with both interstellar transdimensional ETs that are passing through other dimensions, but they're from other star systems and planets, but also ones that can be remote viewed or seen or experienced in consciousness. And some of those civilizations could also get here and visit, but without a spacecraft. They don't have that technology yet. Just like the aboriginals had dream time as a routine way that they communicated at night in, in Australia. You know that story. And that's how they would know what to do the next day. They'd meet a friend in the outback, and they know where to intersect at some remote area, because they did it during their dream. Well, you could do that. If you can do it 10 miles away, you can do it a billion light years away. There's, because you've transcended space-time limitation. Does this make sense yet? All right. I mean, it's very abstract ideas, but I'm trying to relate them to personal experiences that all of you have had, I'm sure. So now you're talking about civilizations that have the ones uh, that are interstellar, have very advanced artificial intelligence. What do I mean by that? Their spacecraft are bio-nano machines. Every special operations force guy I've dealt with who's come up across one of these objects that we have downed using electromagnetic weapons, we'll get to in a moment, since the 40s, that's where Roswell was, will tell you that the craft themselves were living and the craft themselves were conscious. They were conscious to the point that AI, the artificial intelligence associated with the spacecraft, was at the level that the craft emanated the consciousness of the pilot. And the craft itself has a living, organic quality to it, even though it's a machine. So it's a bio-nano machine that's conscious. That's very different from the clunky things Lockheed Martin's making. This is, I'm giving you a little hint here of how you can tell the difference between a covert military UFO and an actual ET spacecraft, interstellar, transdimensional. Zing, got it? Little teachable moment there when you go out into the stars and you're watching. So those spacecraft that are interstellar have this ability to emanate the consciousness of the occupants. And they actually have their function and movement according to the thought uh, now, often they're touching a panel and thinking, and then the craft will go here or there or what have you, or materialize or dematerialize. Very, very advanced stuff. Not your 777, Boeing 777. Now, <laughs> so these, uh, so the craft are interfacing with the beings, but then their communication systems are doing, there are two ways that this is happening. There's technology that is assisting their consciousness. So let's say they want to see another star system on a planet called Earth, and they may be a billion light years from here. They can connect to that, and it is an augmentation system, a magnification system that is electromagnetic, but very advanced, that enables them to see using consciousness. So the technology is assisting the remote viewing function that is innately within all sentient beings. Does this make sense? But there's the reverse, and that's the consciousness assisted technology. So there are technologies on board, all the technologies on board these ET craft can also be interfacing with the consciousness and thought, the in coherent thought, not random, but very directed, coherent, intent thought of the ETs on board. How many people have had a fairly close encounter and seen a craft and felt that it was awake? Felt that the craft itself was awake? Yeah, they are. But they're awake. They're actually just an extension of the consciousness of the occupants. I know, this gets into some weird stuff fast in, in the first 35 minutes. But we got, we're going to get into a lot weirder stuff pretty fast. So, uh, so the very high level ETs um, you know, their consciousness would be similar to these. So the civilizations that have been around 
10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th years, you know, millions to a billion years longer than we have. Both their technologies and their consciousness would be at the celestial slash angelic level, but they still have planetary systems, star systems, physical worlds. But everyone on that planet, even at the time of birth, is born into a state of cosmic consciousness and enlightenment at the time of birth. Eventually, humans will evolve into one of those level 12 civilizations. We're a level zero, by the way. <laughs> Michikaku makes this thing. We have to get to level one, which means you're peaceful, not destroying your environment, and not killing each other. But well, we ain't got there yet. All right, we're trying to, right? That's what we're working towards. Uh, well, some of us. <laughs> Most people, 90 plus percent. So that's another thing to remember. In our CE5 expeditions, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, we'll be out, we'll be having an experience where the experience with an ET civilization will be very similar to an experience with one of the higher angelic celestial, but they're not, and they have spacecraft. I loved it when Monsignor Balducci, the senior theologian at the Vatican, that Paula Harris, um, who couldn't be with us today, she's in Europe, um, introduced me to. And he was, uh, you know, he was a senior theologian to Pope John Paul, and he said to me, you know, angels and demons don't need flying saucers. Simple statement, true statement. <laughs> Think about it. Um, and you know, we, we had a wonderful discussion, and his testimony is in the disclosure material as well, um, as well as the senior astronomer for the Vatican Observatory and project. Most people haven't read it. It's there. And they confirm all of this. But my point is, the civilizations that are extraordinarily advanced are going to really look like magic. <laughs> now. I have to point out to people, let's take a step back to all the, you know, sort of time-centered, reductionist scientific people on the planet listening to this. This cell phone, if you went back in time and handed this to Thomas Jefferson, or worse, to Salem, Massachusetts, you would be considered a warlock, a witch, something. I mean, to have something and be showing another, a video on this from another part of the world, everything we're using today would look like magic to someone only 200 years ago. Now let's extrapolate our technological development that we know about in, in the, in the non-classified world, you know, the world of CNN and the New York Times, i.e. lame. Um, uh, well, they don't know anything, and they're not going to know anything. So to quote a Spook, the first time I was going to brief the CIA director, he says, the president and the CIA director don't know anything, and they're not going to know anything. That's how he worded it. What a nasty piece of work. Anyway, uh, so <laughs> this is something for you to think about, is that if we're, we're talking about civilizations that are in the thousands to millions of years more developed than we are, extrapolate how we've developed since, say, the early 1800s to now. 200 years, and factor in that about 100 years of that period, the big breakthroughs in science, technology, energy, propulsion, anti-gravity, even consciousness technologies have been suppressed and sequestered into unacknowledged special access projects. Now extrapolate a few thousand years forward. That's who and what we're dealing with. Uh, one civilization we had contact with at, at Joshua Tree, uh, there was a senior ambassador named Bijou that we took a photo of. Some of you have seen it. Um, and when I was asking him, you know what it, his IQ was, we had a series of electromagnetic devices that we were using for binary yes, no, confirming communication with the civilization. I said, my sense is that your IQ is around 450. And it signaled yes. And so, you know, most Amer average Americans, 110, 115, um, and it's an algorithmic scale. So you're dealing with civilizations that are very, very advanced, incredibly intelligent, highly conscious, 
and we have to figure their technologies are going to be a, a corollary, are going to parallel that development. Now, the good news is we're also developing that way. They've done studies with meditators, people who meditate, actually have their IQs and every, go up. Everyone's told that you're stuck with what you're born with. Not true. Not true. They actually can go up as you develop higher states of consciousness. We'll get into this and this is another subject. But so imagine civilizations that have been involved with conscious evolution with technological corollaries for thousands to millions of years longer than we have. So that's, just keep that in mind as we go through this. So these phenom this phenomenon of interdimensional weirdness often gets lumped into this experience with actual ETs. And then you get into the mother of all clusterfucks, as the Marines call it. <laughs> and it's, the, excuse my French, but the French would be, mon dieu, that's not French. Um, but this, where you're dealing with classified, unacknowledged special access projects uh, that have the ability and have had the ability since the 50s and 60s to simulate, like a simulator alien experiences. And just a short list of those would be things that look like UFOs that are have been termed ARVs, alien reproduction vehicles. Um, these were first being worked on in the 40s and 50s. Uh, I have a, a gentleman uh, that I've been meeting with whose uh, father is a member of the Majority Intelligence Com Committee, MAGIC, uh, and a senior U.S. senator, former senior U.S. senator. And, you know, he was talking about the fact that his grandfather, Paul Mellon, had gone over to uh, Germany at the end of World War II and retrieved uh, the secret weapon that Hitler was working on, and that was a disc. And, it was a, uh, and they also had a bell that was electromagnetogravitic, sort of anti-gravity. But they hadn't worked out the bugs. They couldn't really control... They would wobble and crash, and they hadn't got it perfected. We got the atomic bomb before they perfected the, the anti-gravity devices. However, Paul Mellon, who along with Alan Dulles and a few other people were key to founding the CIA, went over with George Patton, General Patton, and brought it back to the United States along with the top Nazi scientists under Operation Paperclip. And that you could, I mean, mainstream history books have been written about Operation Paperclip. This is not a conspiracy theory. And, you know, these were people like Herman Oberth and Werner von Braun and a lot of other really brilliant uh, scientists who had worked on these uh, sort of technologies, brought them in, and they became the foundation of our not only intelligence community, but our aerospace, early aerospace research and development community in the United States, which uh, my uncle, who worked on the lunar module, was involved with with North Grumman, but they were, you know, a generation before him even in, in the 40s. So uh, an interesting side note, George Patton wanted to disclose these technologies to the public for the good of humanity. He was assassinated by the Wetworks teams, Wetworks or assassination squads, uh, because he wanted to do so. And the result is, uh, during the Eisenhower years, the projects that were dealing with this area of research, both extraterrestrial and man-made, came together in these unacknowledged special access projects, although they were run into separate compartments. So let me explain what I mean here. And, and you had all the way back to the 20s, T. Townsend Brown, working with very high voltage frequency systems where, in crystalline materials where he, he would have objects levitate, right? This is a matter of public record. And his work then got pulled into the RAND Corporation but, and the Air Force, later in the, the Air Force. But there were also experiments going on in Germany, the Klosky Frost experiment and some others in the late 20s. So by the time the 40s came around, there had been a lot of experimentation with VHV, I call it, very high voltage systems that at certain cycles per second, let's call it hertz, and resonant fields, 
and combined resonant fields with specialized materials, uh, crystalline materials and what have you, would result in a lifter effect, anti-gravity effect, mass cancellation. So those got developed between the 20s and the 40s. This is why I call the chapter in that book, that, uh, book and in the, in the uh, movie, The Lost Century. There's a whole lost century of technology. We're running around with jet engines and cars running ExxonMobil gasoline, unnecessarily, for 100 years. Uh, and we're paying the price now for the environment and geopolitically. But keep in mind that these technologies were on the radar scope of classified projects long before the end of World War II. Uh, a man who lived here in Denver, some of you may have known Dr. Altshuler. How many people knew Dr. Altshuler? He was um, a hematologist, pathologist, wonderful man. He's passed away. His uncle was General Jimmy Doolittle of World War II. And all of you have heard of Foo Fighters, I presume. Well, not the band. So Dave, Dave Grohl named the band after this, what I'm about to tell you. Foo Fighters were these things that we call UFOs in World War II that were zipping around our aircraft and what have you. We thought it was a covert Axis, you know, uh, German technology. The Germans thought it was a covert allied U.S.-British technology. So FDR, Roosevelt, sent General Doolittle over to, World War, over to the theater of operations to look into this. And he looked into it and studied it and came back and told FDR, this was in the 40s, uh, early mid-40s, and said, sir, those are interplanetary vehicles, quote, unquote. So this goes back at least 70-some years and probably longer. The part that people forget is that the human mind and an extraterrestrial mind can discover the same laws of the universe because the laws of the universe are universal. Important point, very important point. So there was this accelerating discovery of electromagnetic, trans-dimensional, and anti-gravity sciences in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s that then got potentiated greatly by the retrieval of extraterrestrial vehicles, the most notorious being the Roswell crash, which I'm sure you've all heard of, but that is by no means the only one, nor was it the first one. There were ones in the 30s and 40s. And those extraterrestrial technologies were then put into a compartmented operation, TSSCI, top secret special compartmented in information or intelligence, that was unacknowledged to be studied. And then there were people doing at the same time work in the conventional anti-gravity, let's call it, electromagnetogravitics is what they're, is properly called, anti-gravity and other systems. And there are very few that would communicate between the two. That was a highly specialized group of people that could cross between the conventional R&D labs that were classified and unacknowledged, and the extraterrestrial research projects that were also unacknowledged, because compartmentalization is the name of the game of, of, of secrecy. Uh, a man who's recently surfaced and is working with me has been in, uh, was cleared to 18 of these unacknowledged special access projects, or USAPs, and he's providing me information about these 18 projects. And he was in them between 2002 and 2012. So it's a lot of current information. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, what I'm trying to portray here is something you need to know historically. Because everyone will say, oh, we have these, air these spacecraft that are ARVs at Lockheed Martin, Lock in Northrop, and Boeing, and all these outfits that are in EG&G. Those are. People say, oh, those were all based on ET spacecraft. They were not. They're a combination of man-made breakthroughs in science and technology that was classified being pushed along by the study of extraterrestrial technologies, which is a much heavier lift, much harder to do, because you're looking at something you have no clue what it could be used for. Um, the other part of that's being developed and has been developed for some years 
are, is this area, the program life forms. These are what people normally call aliens, the grays, the this, the that. Um, I know men who've worked in those labs making these little creatures. Uh, they are they're kind of boogamy. They're sort of <laughs> creepy. But they have integrated circuits in their cortex, but they are also biological. So there's a genetic program that will take genetic material from a dead uh, or living extraterrestrial, develop it, and then put in integrated circuits, and then create a sort of robotic creature that passes quite well as an alien. Um, there's a, a man who has lived in the area named Stan Romanek, and uh, Ricky Butterfass, who's here, and I went to go visit him a few years ago. And I, I'm sure all of you have seen this, uh, heard about his experience with Boo and this ET that was popping up. But what you didn't see, because I think Disney bought up the rights to it, was some footage of one getting into his house when he had his camera running. And there were all these weird electromagnetic effects happening in, in his house. His, his, his medicine bottles, the plastic was melting, and all kinds of weird stuff. And he shows us this video, and I'm sitting there with Ricky and a, a MUFON, I think, state director, or somebody who who's researches this issue with MUFON. And it shows this creature coming in, and it's very jerky, kind of moving. And then the camera falls over. They had thrown a chemical canister in. He passes out, has a classic abduction experience. Now, to 99.9999999999999% of the population, they've just had an encounter with an alien. Not they had an encounter with one of these. Got to get your minds around this. Now, have people had real experiences with real ETs? Yes but they get simulated. And someone who's had an actual experience with a real ET, sometimes to confuse them, will then be targeted with a PLF and an ARV and a lot of other weird stuff we're gonna get into to confuse their memory and the experience. Counterintelligence programs are quite well developed in this area, quite well, and very good at what they do. So I turned to Stan and the other people. I said, well, that's a PLF. And he said, what's that? I said, you cannot be doing UFO research and not know what a program life form is or an ARV is. Since about 80% of the phenomenon being reported is this, not this. This gets blacklisted. These get reported and published. Because the publishing houses, the big media, will be told, cover this. Don't cover this. Told you it'd be a mind fuck. <laughs> so, but, excuse me, the third time I've used that word, sorry. But I think what you have to begin to understand is that it is. Because, you know, in 1991, 92, 93, when I was first emerging into this area, I didn't think any of this could be possible. It is. And this is what they don't want you to know. They want you to be confused, and they want you to be played to support the alien invasion agenda, which is the big punchline of the secrecy. That and keeping the technology secret, so we have to burn oil and make people trillions of dollars that way. But you have to understand this. These are even more concerning. And this has been going on since at least the 50s that I know about, 1950s. So I'll give you a timeline, anti-gravity, gravity control, October 1954 is when that was mastered. Program life forms were later in the 60s, 70s, 80s. In the 50s and 60s, they were using a lot of stagecraft with people made up to look like an ET. I've talked with some intelligence people who said, oh yeah, we take someone who is very short or very unusual looking and do a certain kind of makeup like in Hollywood and put them on board of one of these uh, ARVs and have them abduct somebody. Very effective. Stagecraft, it's called. The electromagnetic uh, interdimensional portals are even a greater concern. And some of you have heard of these sort of events happening in places like Montauk um, and other facilities where uh, also at the Lockheed Skunk Works, and I, I remember meeting with the Skunk Works, very highly classified uh, officers. Actually, it was a man who was introduced 
to me by the head of Lockheed International. And they had a laboratory where they could hook people up to an electromagnetic console to tap into these other dimensions, not ET, and bring into 3D an actual being from that dimension. And it'd be running around the lab like some kind of monster or boogum. Very advanced stuff in the hands of some very strange people with an agenda to deceive. Counterintelligence is all about deception. So then, have I lost you all yet? Just, we ain't got started yet, huh?